Hi, welcome to my lecture on geo databases. My name is Stuart Bruce. I'm GIS program coordinator at Washington College, and I'm going to try to enlighten you on the wonderful world of geo databases. The purpose of this lesson is really to introduce you to some of the basic tools that you're going to use to establish one of the three types of geo databases, the personal geo database. And we're going to teach you some settings for creating spatial layers that can take advantage of some of the functions of a geo database. In our series of courses as part of geoworkshops.org, uh, this is the first of two separate um, lessons that we have on geo databases. This is really the introductory level. We have a more advanced level geo database course in our 200 series um, courses. Now, in order to appreciate the geo database, it helps to have a little bit of understanding of some of the previous spatial data formats that work with the ESRI product. The data looks the same if you have parcels or roads. It doesn't really matter what data format you use, you'll see parcels or roads, but how that data is handled internally to the ArcGIS product has changed dramatically over the years. Now, the first um, spatial uh, data file format that was designed by ESRI was called the ArcInfo coverage. It was originally designed to work within the Unix operating system. Um, you may not recall um, how computers worked in the, say, the 80s and the early 90s, but a lot of GIS users used the SunSpark workstations, uh, very expensive machines. Some of the key points of uh, the ArcInfo coverage is that it is a proprietary vector data format. The coverage is stored in a director or folder structure. And whenever you see an ArcInfo coverage, there are always two folders. There's one folder called the Info. Um, this basically has a bunch of unique information about the coverage. And there's another folder that would usually have the name of the layer. You need both of those folders in order to make coverage. Now the info folder uh, contains information about potentially multiple data layers. So within a folder structure, uh, as seen below, where you see it says coverages, and then we have a roads layer and a streams layer, uh, and we also have an info layer. So the roads layer, or the roads folder, contains information about roads, the streams folder contains information about streams, and the info folder contains information related to both of those different layers. So it's almost impossible to copy a coverage by using regular Windows Explorer. You really have to use the Esri tools, more specifically, Art Catalog, to copy coverages from one location to another. Uh, this makes it kind of difficult to move this data around. Uh, it's difficult to email uh, an ArcInfo coverage of someone unless you uh, basically convert it into what's known as a ArcInfo interchange file with a file extension of a .e00. Now, one of the benefits of a coverage, and there's actually quite a few benefits to a coverage, uh, one is that a coverage could contain multiple vector types in the same coverage. So you could have points, you could have lines, you could have polygons, you could have annotation, all within one coverage. Now, the ability to have multiple vector types uh, within a single coverage is, is a very good feature, um, very useful to have. And there were some other issues related to topology that a coverage had that was also extremely useful. Topology is really um, something that um, allows you to maintain spatial relationships between different features. When uh, ESRI switched to the shapefile format, the topology was lost in the transition. Now this diagram here uh, really gives you an idea of what topology is. So you can see we have three polygons, polygon A, B, C, uh, and the D would be the exterior of the polygons. So topology is the spatial relationship between these different spatial features. So they share common borders, they share common vertices, uh, and this information is important to be captured within a GIS. If you have topology, then you can validate topology rules. For example, you don't want to have things like overlapping polygons, 
are gaps between the polygons and the different data layers. Now, another um, file format that relates to the coverage is what's known as the ArcInfo grid. It uses the same folder format as the coverage, but instead of managing vector data, it manages raster data. Um, the grid raster file formats uh, really not totally gone away because there's a lot of ArcGIS tools that you will use that deal with rasters. The standard output from these tools is a grid format. Now, what are the downsides of the coverage? Because um, so far it uh, sounds pretty cool. Um, the probably one of the bigger uh, downsides is that uh, in the days of Unix, uh, it worked very well. But with the introduction of Windows, it started becoming obsolete. Now, it's not necessarily that the coverage itself was obsolete. It's just that the original uh, operating system or platform for the ESRI product was called ArcInfo, and ArcInfo was designed to work on a Unix workstation. With the introduction of Windows, ESRI came up with a new product called ArcView that could operate on the Windows platform. They also then developed this new data format called the shapefile. The other issue is that the proprietary nature of the coverage limited sharing of GIS data between different applications that were non-ESRI. Now, prior to the Windows uh, NT 4.0 operating system, the coverage and uh, ArcInfo itself would not work well in a Windows environment. And then sort of the other issue is that the ArcInfo software itself was very complex to use. Um, it took a lot of training, had a lot of uh, keystroke commands, which are used in sort of the Unix operating system. And this complexity hindered new users, such as yourself, from actually doing GIS work. Not to mention the fact that uh, a Unix SunSpark workstation um, costs around twenty or $25,000, uh, if you can imagine that in today's market. So ESRI invented the shapefile. The shapefile was really designed to be used on a personal computer. Um, it was still a proprietary data format, but ESRI sort of published what this was, and that allowed other vendors of GIS software to create connectivity between the Esri product line and their product line. It started with the ArcView product and kind of advanced and developed all the way through ArcView uh, version 3.x. Now, shapefiles have multiple files. So unlike the coverages, which are organized into a folder format, shapefile consists of a number of individual files. Now the diagram that I'm showing here um, basically indicates we have perhaps a .shp, a .shx, a .dbf. These are the three fundamental files for a shapefile. But you may have other files. For example, you could have a projection file called .prj. You could have an ArcView legend file with a .avl. And there were a few other examples. So potentially with a shapefile, you could have um, six, seven, maybe eight different files that together make up the shapefile. Now, geodatabases was a solution to some of the problems that developed here. So we had all this functionality in a coverage, topology being one of the main things, and the ability to have point lines and polygons within a single uh, folder. Shapefiles uh, could only exist. Um, you could have a point shapefile. You could have a uh, line or a polygon shapefile. There was no such thing at all as an annotation shapefile. And in shapefiles, we lost the topology. So the ability to prevent things like overlapping polygons, slivers, um, and other topological problems disappeared with the shapefile. So Esri invented the geodatabase which solved all of these problems. Now, in the big picture here, uh, I kind of want to point out, um, this slide uh, says ArcGIS 9. Of course, we're up to ArcGIS 10 right now. But this will give you sort of a picture of the entire ESRI product family. So you are working right now with desktop GIS. And most of you will probably have the ArcView uh, desktop product. Um, we're actually using the ArcInfo product. And as I explained in one of our earlier lessons, uh, the difference really between ArcView and ArcInfo is simply that ArcInfo has more tools. 
Now, back in the days when you had ARC Info 7 and ARC View 3, um, these softwares were not the same. So when a user uh, basically uh, transferred to a higher um, software with more functionality, they really had to relearn the entire interface. But notice in this diagram that really the ArcGIS desktop product is only one of the many products that are available with the ArcGIS data family. So we have things like uh, ArcGIS server, uh, we have ArcIMS, there's ArcGIS for mobile applications, and there's also some real enterprise level uh, functionality uh, by the use of ARC SDE, which stands for Spatial Data Engine, which can connect to very robust database management systems such as Oracle or, um, for example, uh, Microsoft SQL Server Enterprise. So it's really a big family of products. And in our courses, we're just learning really the entry level desktop product. So let's explore geodatabases a little bit. What are, what are they all about? Now, when I describe a geodatabase, I really like to talk about a geodatabase as a container. Um, and if you look inside uh, Art Catalog, for example, when you see a geodatabase, it looks like a little drum. So if you think of a geodatabase as, uh, for example, a giant 55-gallon oil drum, it's really a huge container. And in this container, you can do a number of different things. So you can import data. For example, uh, we have the capability of importing any previous ESRI spatial data format, such as a <coughs> coverage or a shape file, into the new format. We can actually bring in CAD drawings, for example, from AutoCAD or from MicroStation can be imported into the GeoDatabase. And we can also add things like tables and rasters. In addition to bringing in data that already exists, you can create new data. So we can create new points, lines, or polygons. We can create what are known as annotation feature classes. And we can also create new tables. So into this container, you can put an awful lot of stuff. There are three types of geodatabases that you will use. The first one is known as a personal geodatabase. And the personal geodatabase, ah, excuse me, the personal geodatabase uses a Microsoft Access format. Um, there are some benefits to the personal geodatabase. Um, our lesson uh, has you use the personal geodatabase because it's mainly because it's really easy to uh, upload your geodatabase so we can see what you develop. And since it follows the Microsoft Access database format, uh, you can have a lot of different things in your geodatabase, but you're only creating a single file on your computer that has multiple things inside it. This makes it easily portable. Some of the limitations of the personal geodatabase, it does have a data storage limit. So if you exceed two gigabytes of data, uh, the personal geodatabase will, um, I've never actually tried to do that, but if you can imagine that oil drum blowing up and spilling the oil everywhere, uh, it's just not gonna work. Another serious limitation is that you can only have a single user at a time if you're doing editing. Now, ESRI, uh, realized these limitations, and they wanted to come up with a new product. So introducing um, in ArcGIS 9, they came up with the file geodatabase. So some of the benefits are, number one, it's not dependent on the Microsoft operating system. So in theory, Esri can now develop the ArcGIS product to work on, for example, a Linux, or who knows, maybe even a Macintosh file format down the road. It has a single folder structure, so in some respects it's actually uh, quite similar to the ARC info coverage, except there's no info folder. Now it's not quite as portable uh, because there's so many files inside the folder, but you could zip the folder and then transmit the data. Now I've listed here that uh, there's a one terabyte data limit. Um, some additional research I've shown in listening to some uh, Esri uh, propaganda indicates that this data limit could be much higher. But honestly, the average user is never going to come even close to a terabyte. That's actually quite a lot of data. Another big advantage of the file geodatabase, it handles raster imagery better. And according to ESRI, it handles data processing much faster. So the personal geodatabase, for example, you could it looked like you could add raster data to it, but really what you were doing was managing the raster data, and the data was not actually contained inside the geodatabase. 
with the file geo database that raster data is inside that file geo database folder so for organizational purposes it's a very big advantage now enterprise geo databases uh, basically are used for large operations um, let's say for example the um, city of Baltimore government probably uses an enterprise geo database um, it's really for very large operations uh, it is very complex and it's not actually discussed in great depth in this particular course now some of the requirements for enterprise geo databases uh, it does require that you have arc editor or arc info you would also have to have arc sde so you could manage it your connections to relational databases. These databases could include things like Oracle, <coughs> SQL Server, Informex, or DB2, and none of these are inexpensive. So you're also going to need a large amount of money. So all that software is very, very expensive. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server Enterprise, for example, list price uh, or street price is about $39,000. Arc Info costs ten thousand um, bucks. Arc SDE, I believe, costs several thousand dollars. So next thing you know, you spent a hundred thousand dollars just on the software. Then you're going to need a vast amount of knowledge, as um, if you've ever uh, looked at things like uh, Oracle or uh, SQL Server Enterprise. This is a very complex software, and it requires very skilled professionals in your organization to know how these operate. All that adds up to a lot of money. Now, I do want to discuss some of the benefits of personal and file geo databases um, so that you have some understanding of uh, some of the reasons that I think that they are uh, a big improvement and um, you definitely should be using them uh, solely for all of your GIS data work. So portability and data management, um, the geo database allows you to neatly organize a lot of different files in a single geo database. So you can have all the data you needed for a single project located in one geo database. This then simplifies the backup of your data. So you only really have to either uh, back up a single personal geo database or you have to back up a single file location. This makes data easier to share. Uh, it's easier to document the data. And it definitely does have an improved database format. All of this goes to making your life a little bit simpler. Now, another thing I want to bring up is this concept of shape area and shape length. Uh, we talked about this, uh, I think, to some extent in our data frames lesson. But um, trying to picture this. So if we look at the polygon A and the polygon B, uh, if we modified polygon A to look like polygon B, what has changed about the spatial attributes for polygon B? Well, basically, what's changed is the area and the perimeter of polygon B has changed. Now, in the old shapefile data format, if you edited polygon A to look like polygon B, it would not update some of the area and perimeter fields in the shapefile. You would have had to have manually recalculated the area and perimeter. Now, the bad part about that is lots of people forgot to do this or they didn't even know they had to do it in the first place. So in the geo database format, whenever you edit a file and you save it, it automatically recalculates your area and perimeter for you within the shape area and shape length field. Now, the only thing that it doesn't do, if you have a derivative field such as acres. So let's say you have your shape area and your shape length, but you also have an acres field. So if you recalculate uh, and change the polygon and you change the area and perimeter it automatically updates the shape area and shape length but you would still have to manually update the derived fields such as acres so please don't forget that or you're going to end up with some completely bogus analysis on your data and remember too that when you reproject data to a new projection it changes the area and the perimeter now this diagram here um, is sort of showing uh, a little bit more uh, detail of the shape length and shape area field. A frequent question that we get is uh, when you see these numbers in your attribute table for your feature classes, a lot of people ask, well, what are the units of measurement for these? 
Well, the shape length and the shape area are always in the units of measurement for the projection. So if you want to go and figure that out, all you would have to do is open up the layer properties and then look at the, I believe it's the um, source field, and that will tell you what projection the data is in, and then you can determine what the units of measurement are. Well, the next thing I want to talk about, and I think this is actually a, a huge benefit of the geodatabase, is this concept of attribute domains. Now, I remember um, many years ago, probably longer than I'd like to remember, uh, I was working at Mifflin County, and I was given access to our property database. And I had an assignment to try to figure out what type of heating systems were being used in homes in Mifflin County, Pennsylvania. But when I got to the data, what I found was that there was very little data entry control uh, by the clerks that worked down in the assessment office. And they had many different clerks, uh, and they all had different ways of determining data. So I was trying to figure out how many homes had oil, hot water, heat. And inside that database, I actually found 17 different ways that you can say oil, hot water, heat. Well, this is a problem if you have clerks entering data, and they have the option to type in, well, quite frankly, anything that they want. Attribute domains can prevent that. So if you know, for example, in a particular data field that there's only a certain number of variables that you can use, you can pre-program that by creating this attribute domain. Then when the data entry operator goes ahead and tries to fill it in, instead of having to type it in, they would hit a drop down menu and they would pick basically the correct code and you will eliminate data entry errors. Plus it's a little bit quicker because you don't have to actually type that in. The other thing that you can do in a geodatabase, which is uh, really cool, is that if you know, for example, that 70% uh, of your uh, feature classes all have a certain code, you can make that code default. So if you're doing a lot of digitizing, let's say, for example, on land use, uh, and you know that you have mostly agricultural land, you can make agriculture the default uh, code. This will save you a ton of labor and allow you to be more efficient in your operations. There are different types of attribute domains that you can pick. Uh, one of them is known as the range domain. So let's say you're mapping hydrants and you know that the range is between 0 to 100 PSI. Well, you can set up a range domain that will prevent a person from entering in a value that's outside that range. Again, this will help prevent data entry errors. Coded domains are also very valuable. In a coded domain, what you can do is, uh, let's say, for example, you're mapping trees and you know there's certain kind of trees, you would go ahead and create the domain and have these different type of trees there from that drop down, pull down menu. It also works very well for things like numeric values on pipe size. You can set a default value, which I kind of already mentioned. Um, so I'm going to kind of blow through this here. And you can also set null value. So if you want, you can have the field so that null value is not acceptable and it forces the data operator to enter some kind of value in that field. Now, the next super huge benefit of geodatabases is that it does allow you to create an annotation feature class. Now, if you recall, the ARC info coverage had an annotation feature class. And then when we started using the shape file, there was no annotation feature class. Well, the geodatabase reintroduces functionality that previously existed with the coverage. Now, I mentioned here previous issues related to annotation with coverages and shape files are also resolved. Uh, there was some issue, and this actually caused me a lot of grief when I was uh, working at Mifflin County. I would do my annotation in a coverage. I would bring it in the ArcView product, and you did some really complex issues with font sizes and font types and how the two different softwares drew the text. The text never ended up in the same spot. Um, so the geodatabase has resolved that issue. Now, since annotation uh, is the biggest headache for any GIS user, this is a really great benefit. And if you put it into um, a scale here, uh, let's say you were working in York County, Pennsylvania. There's around 160,000 parcels. Each parcel could have six pieces of text. Well, that comes out to a whopping almost 1 million individual pieces of text that somebody in your organization has to be responsible for placing all that text. It's a gigantic pain, 
and the geodatabase allows you the tools that you need to properly handle annotation. The other big benefit is raster management. So you can create things like raster catalogs, uh, you can store pictures that are hyperlinked to individual spatial features. Uh, we have a whole lesson on hyperlinking in our 200 level courses, uh, one of my favorite lessons. Uh, and you can also um, access raster data through the identify button uh, if you have your rasters in a geo database. So huge benefits for raster uh, management for organizations, big or small. Now, there are some concerns and cautions that I should warn you about. One of those is that geo databases are not backwards compatible. So if you're using ArcGIS 10 and other people are using ArcGIS 9, they will not be able to read your ArcGIS 10 geo database. Now, you have the capability using some of the Arc Toolbox tools that you can um, convert a Arc 10 geo database into a previous version. But quite honestly, the simplest thing to do is make sure everyone in your organization is at the same level of ArcGIS software that you're using. So to sum it up, geo databases are great. So stop using those shape files and stop using coverages and use the format that is the future of the ArcGIS product line. Thank you very much for your time today. And uh, I hope that you enjoy the practical exercise that we have for you and have a great day.